Mount McKinley is one of Alaska's biggest tourist attractions, with thousands of visitors coming each year to see North America's tallest mountain. One of the popular places from which to view the mountain is Wonder Lake. Both Mount McKinley and Wonder Lake are located in Denali National Park. Visitors come to the park to not only see the mountain and beautiful scenery, but also the abundance of wildlife. Caribou, moose, bears, and many other Alaskan species can be seen in their natural habitat. Just north of Wonder Lake are the Kantishna Hills, which before the gold rush in the early 1900s were the hunting grounds of the Dana Athabascan Indians. The Dana called Mount McKinley Denali, which means the Great One. They have a legend of how Denali and surrounding mountains were formed as a result of a battle of magic between two shaman. The outcome of the battle was that the good shaman lived happily ever after with his bride he had taken from the bad shaman's village, and their children became the Dana people. The bad shaman was turned into a raven and forced to live on the scraps of the Dana people. The Dana called the Kantishna Hills the Chitsia Hills, named after Chitsia Mountain. Chitsia means moose heart, and the mountain was given the name because its top is shaped like a moose heart. About 60 miles west of Chitsia Mountain is Lake Minchumina. Minchumina means large lake, and it is the largest lake in the area. The lake was where the Dana had their summer fish camps. There, they caught white fish and hung them to dry to feed themselves and their sled dogs for year-round use. When winter came, some of the Dana remained at Menchumina, and others took the 40-mile-long winter trail to Talaita Village. They remained in Talaita for the winter and returned in the spring to Lake Menchumina. Talaita is about 60 miles west of Mount McKinley. Carl Sasui and his wife lived in Talaita Village, where Carl's father was the chief. They are seen here with their large dogs, used for sled dogs in the winter and pack dogs in the summer. These pictures of the Dana were taken by Stephen Foster who is seen here with Chief Deerfan. It was thought that Foster came to the area during the 1905 gold rush. He started living at Menchumina in 1912 and had a fox farm and trading post there. He also tried his hand at being a trapper and big game guide, but in 1917 became the game warden for the area. What became of him after 1922 is a mystery. In May of 1903, the steamboat Tanana Chief left Fairbanks and was the first to go up the Tanana River. Upon reaching the mouth of the Kantishna River, it waited until the spring ice flow subsided and then continued on up the Kantishna River. On board was an exploring party led by Judge James Wickersham. As they made their way up the river, they visited three Dana camps. It was the first time the Dana had ever seen a steamboat, and they were very curious as to where the party was going and for what purpose. When they asked, Wickersham said they were going to climb to the top of Denali. One Dana asked, What for you go top? Gold? Wickersham replied, No, we go merely to see the top, to be the first men to reach the summit. At this, the Dana laughed 
and said they were fools. As Wickersham's party made their way up the Kantishna, the first Dana camp that they encountered was called Nachereha's camp. The leader of the camp was Nachereha. His name fit him as it meant moose hunter. About 50 Dana were camped here on their return to the lower Tanana River area after having been on a late winter hunt in the hills. The second camp they visited was called Tuktawagana. It was the camp of Konha, the blind shaman, and his two wives, and also an undetermined number of people. It was at this camp that Konha told Wickersham the legend of how Denali was formed. The third camp they encountered was called Anotoktilon. Upon reaching the last Dana camp, Wickersham met Chief Sasui and his wife. He was the chief of Talida village, who in 1899 saved a U.S. military party who were lost and about to perish. He was able to do so because out of curiosity, he backtracked a bear he had killed who had bacon in its stomach. Chief Sasui advised the Wickersham party to now leave their boats behind and travel across land to their destination. They took his advice and started hiking with very heavy packs. They also had two mules they had brought on the boat with them, which helped pack their supplies and wood they cut when camping. The Dana never had seen mules before and immediately called them the white man's moose. The party traveled towards the Chitsia Creek and camped at the foot of Chitsia Mountain. Some of the party climbed to the top of the mountain to see the view of their path before them. The next day, party members prospected Chitsia Creek for gold and were successful in finding paying quantities. From the Journal of Judge Wickersham, on June 4, we staked placer claims. These were the first mining claims located in this region. We filed our notices of location of these claims in the recorder's office at Rampart the following July. We also filed a map which was immediately copied by numerous prospectors and the next year, a horde of these hardy men explored every creek in this land for gold and actually located rich placer diggings on Moose Creek, across which we had carelessly passed with our eyes fixed on the crest of Denali. It became the center of the rich Kantishna mining district. Wickersham's party continued on to Wonder Lake and crossed the McKinley River flood plain, then on up Denali. They climbed about 10,000 feet till they reached a perpendicular wall, which is about a quarter of a mile high. The wall has come to be known as Wickersham's Wall. The party had no choice but to turn back and raft back down the Kantishna River. In 1904, Joe Dalton and a partner prospected in the basin of the Toklat River and found gold in encouraging amounts on Crooked Creek. The next year, in the summer of 1905, Two other prospectors, Joe Quigley and partner Jack Horn, prospected Glacier Creek and Quigley later filed claims on Quigley Ridge. In June of that year, they carried the news of their discovery to Fairbanks and so started the Stampede to Kantishna. Within several weeks, towns were constructed Eureka in no time had several hundred people living there and was to become the present-day settlement of Kantishna. 
Two of the largest towns in the area were Glacier City and Diamond City. By the spring of 1906, a mass exodus occurred as numerous disappointed treasure seekers left the area. Of the Alaskan pioneers that lived in the area, perhaps the most well-known are Joe and Fanny Quigley. Joe first entered Alaska through the Chilkoot Pass in 1891 and prospected around Circle City and Forty Mile River. The Quigleys made their home on what was originally called Mineral Ridge, but was soon changed to Quigley Ridge. They had a four-building complex, three buildings to accommodate guests and storage, and their main house at the top of Quigley Hill. Near their house was the entrance to Red Top Mine, which was one of several load mines Joe had worked throughout the years. Fanny arrived in Alaska in 1898 with thousands of other treasure seekers. She started out as a dance hall girl in Dawson and later cooked for miners, which earned her the name Fanny the Hike because she would be the first on the scene when a new strike occurred with her sign that read, Meals for Sale. In 1906, she stampeded to Kantishna country and soon started living with Joe, later marrying in 1918. Joe found a number of lead, zinc, silver, gold, and copper bearing veins further on up Quigley Ridge from their home. His little Annie mine was located a few miles further up the ridge. Mines in the area were often visited by government auditors. Standing in front of the little Annie mine is an auditor and little Johnny Boucher, who was one of Fanny and Joe's closest friends and neighbor. The Red Top Mine, located near their home, contained base ore of silver and gold. It had to be hauled 28 miles by dog team to the Kantishna River and eventually ended up in a smelter in Tacoma, Washington. The ore had to be at least worth $150 a ton for Joe to break even. Bags of the ore were stockpiled to await shipment. Joe's placer ground never proved rich, but others were successful in the Eureka area, using their sluices to recover gold. During the early 20s, there was silver mining in the Kantishna district, but the miners had a serious transportation problem. The ore had to be hauled by horses from Eureka to Glacier City and then over a 22-mile-long road to Roosevelt. Steamers barged the ore down the Kantishna River to the Tanana River, eventually reaching St. Michael's at the mouth of the Yukon, and then on to Tacoma, Washington by ocean steamer. Steamers pushing barges up and down the Kantishna River continued to be, for many years, the way supplies were brought in and ore was taken out. During the late 20s, hydraulic placer mining was tried on Moose Creek and Eureka Creek. $90,000 was spent on two hydraulic projects. For one of the projects, a 12,000 foot long ditch, six feet wide and two feet deep, was built from Wonder Lake to the mining site to obtain water. The projects were soon abandoned because gold recovery was below expectations. Eureka, located at the foot of Quigley Ridge, was a summer mining camp for most of the miners. They would move north to Glacier in the winter where the timber and big game were in abundance. One of Glacier's most prominent residents and property owners was Polly LeBeau, 
She was the first and only woman to cross the Alaska Range over Muldroon Glacier. She came in 1918 and acquired several mining camps and was known to be quite a wrestler. Two visitors to Glacier were Miss Lindstrow and Miss Ryan. They are seen here with Joe Dalton. Party time at Glacier City. Attending was Joe Quigley, Joe Sway, Miss Lindstrom, Miss Ryan, and Nels Henderson, whom for years hauled supplies used in Kentishna from Fairbanks with a gas boat. He is seen here with his partner, Walter Ames, at Square Deal with Henderson's boat and leaving the docks at Ninana. For many years to come, the Kantishna River would be used as a transportation route in and out of the Kantishna Hills. Passengers traveling on boat up and down the Kantishna River encountered Athabascan Indian fish camps along the banks. Fish wheels used to catch salmon could be seen turning in the river. The Athabascans cut, smoked, and dried the fish for year-round use. Occasional glimpses of Mount McKinley could be seen in the distance, and a few Athabascan Indian villages were passed as boats went up and down the Kantishna River. Most of the miners spent their winter farther north. The Quigleys lived year-round on Quigley Ridge. The ridge was above timberline, so there was a great amount of drifting snow because of the lack of shelter from wind. Dog teams were the only source of transportation in winter, and people all over Alaska used dogs to do their work. Both Fanny and Joe were mushers. Because their home was above timberline, there was no source of firewood nearby. Firewood had to be hauled by dog team from as much as 20 miles away. Fanny did a lot of other jobs that men do, such as sawing firewood and trapping. Both Fanny and Joe were very good hunters. A subsistence hunting ethic evolved among the permanent residents of the Kantishna area, and some market hunting was done to keep the mining camp supplied. A well-known story about Fanny was that she was moose hunting on high country without shelter, and it started to get dark by the time she spotted a moose. Fanny killed the moose with one shot, gutted it, and solved the problem of where to spend the night by crawling inside the warm carcass. The carcass froze while she slept, and she had, in her own words, one heck of a time cutting her way out. Another hunting story about Fanny was the time she shot a bull caribou, and he ran out into the Moose Creek and stood there a while, and then fell down dead in the icy water. Many hunters would have left the meat in the river. Not Fanny. She waded out into the freezing water and tied a rope to him and pulled him in. During the summer, one of the Quigley's pet projects was their garden. Because the soil near their cabin was not fit for gardening, soil was hauled by dog team from the flats near Moose Creek. The garden was terraced with rocks so that the sun warmed the rocks during the day and they retained the heat during the night to keep the soil warm. Though Fanny was the head gardener, Jo also shared her interests and helped with the gardening. Although the growing season lasted 10 weeks, 
They were successful in raising rhubarb, potatoes, celery, carrots, beets, turnips, onions, lettuce, radishes, and cabbages. Because of the 24-hour sunlight, they grew very large. Fanny also grew flower gardens with a variety of flowers. Pansies were her favorite, though, and she grew them to unusually large sizes. She took note of their colors and dried them. Then she reproduced them in needlework in the exact colors nature had chosen. Not only was Fanny a good hunter, trapper, musher, gardener, and seamstress, but she was also a good cook. Preparing full course meals from what she obtained off the land other than sugar and flour. Both Fanny and Joe had many talents. Joe was a jack of all trades, a carpenter, blacksmith, scientific prospector, trapper, musher, and one of the best hunters and rifle shots in the country. He was also a very good photographer and did most of his own developing and printing. This documentation of the Quigley's life would not have been possible without the excellent photos Joe took. Joe seemed to also have a talent for getting into accidents. Joe would stay alone for weeks working at his mines. One time, Joe was working in the tunnel of a mine when it caved in. His shoulder and leg were broken, but he managed to drag himself out of the mine and crawled several feet to his cabin located close to the entrance of the mine. Joe lay in the cabin several hours unconscious. Once or twice a week, Fanny would come to the mine and pack food and supplies to Joe with her pack dogs. Joe had laid in the cabin for 24 hours before Fanny arrived and found him there. Fanny went for help to the nearest prospector camp. Every prospector in the area came to help Joe. They carried him to the landing field where pilot Joe Crossan arrived from Fairbanks and flew Quigley to the hospital. Joe spent many months in the hospital in Fairbanks before he could walk again. Years before that, Joe had his first bad accident. In 1926, Joe chartered an airplane from Fairbanks to fly him home to Kantishna. There wasn't any landing field there yet, so the pilot tried to land on a gravel bar along Moose Creek. They crashed, and Joe ended up with his nose split wide open. Fanny, who was an artist with a needle, sewed it up with a baseball stitch. Landing in Kantishna later became much safer as a landing field was constructed in 1927 and a newer one in 1941, which is still used to this very day. Both were located in the Moose Creek Valley below Quigley Ridge. They could be seen from the Quigley's home complex on Quigley Ridge. Some people even called it Fanny's Airport as adventurous bush pilots often landed there to visit Fanny. The opening of McKinley National Park, later called Denali National Park, in 1917 brought many visitors to the area and Fanny had her share of them. Park rangers and superintendents often visited Fanny and found it to be the highlight of their stay in the Kantishna area. Not only did Fanny have visitors, but she did some visiting herself. She is seen here visiting at the Black Rapids Roadhouse on the Richardson Highway, a considerable distance from her home in Kantishna. In the late 30s, Park buses came to Wonder Lake and then to Kantishna, and Fanny would have visitors at her cabin on Quigley Ridge.
She would show them her garden, which surprised many of the tourists that such a garden could grow above timberline. Fanny was a very humorous person and liked to joke around. She is seen here joking around with some of the tourists. Her husband Joe, wanting to retire to a softer life, left in the 30s and moved to Seattle where he remarried. He revisited Alaska at age 81. Fanny continued to have visitors at her new house built in the early 40s. It was located near the airport in Moose Creek Valley. She died there in her sleep at age 73 in 1944. The house is still standing and maintained by the Park Service. You can visit the house when in Kantishna. Some people say that Fanny's new house was built for her by Johnny Boucher, the Quigley's longtime closest friend and neighbor. After Joe left, Johnny kept watch over Fanny from a distance, knowing her independent nature. He was, as were the Quigleys, a trapper, musher, prospector, and lived from the land, but he had one more talent of his own. He made a homebrew that was called Cantishna Champagne, and it was reported to be one of the best talents he had and Fanny Quigley was known to be his very best customer. Johnny was the last living Kantishna miner. He is seen here with Bill Julian, who was the next to last miner of Kantishna. The two men are seen here in front of the old Kantishna Roadhouse, which is still standing today. It was the town hall of Kantishna. To the north of the old hall were some of the cabins of the town of Kantishna. It is the location of the present day Kantishna Roadhouse. Perhaps the most memorable Kantishna Hills pioneer was Fanny Quigley. Fanny and Joe never had children, but her name and pioneer legend lives on today in Kantishna. The remoteness and inaccessibility brought about by Denali National Park and Preserve Preservation Policies maintains the wilderness experience that gives us all a taste of what pioneer life might have been like in the Kantishna Hills.